Golden State Media Concepts Sci-Fi Podcast. Together we dive into the world of sci-fi and science fiction. From episodes of Star Trek, Star Wars, to The Walking Dead, Resident Evil, all the hot new science fiction movies from the back doors of Marvel or DC. The Golden State Media Concepts Sci-Fi Podcast. You'll never look at science fiction the same way again. Sci-Fi Podcast, brought to you by the GSMC Podcast Network. I'm your host, Alex. Today, we're going to talk about the fifth episode of The Boys Season 2. I'm trying not to get too far ahead of myself, so I still have not finished this season. Just between us. So I'm very excited still to finish the last few episodes, but I wanted to cover episode 5 before I move forward. You know, if you end up binging them, then they all kind of blend together anyway, so I wanted to take my time with this first. It's kind of nice, though, making myself wait for the next episode. I mean, the show was already doing that by releasing them once per week, like it was 1995 again. We'll see how that sticks, though. I've seen mixed reviews on that. Some people love it and some people hate it. There doesn't really seem to be a lot of people who are meh about it. It's it's a lot of strong opinions, you guys. Um, I, for one, am still undecided. I'm going to make up my mind when I get to the last episode. Once I finish that and I can look back on the pacing and everything, I think I'll go from there. On the one hand, Game of Thrones and shows like that have gotten us used to having to wait a really long time for distributing serialized episodes on a weekly basis. And on the other hand, we have shows that are meant for binging and are released on streaming platforms like Netflix and Hulu and Amazon Prime. So I think part of it is that in subverting expectations, it makes it hard to manage expectations. And that's why things are so polarizing right now. You have the people who are the big fan of the serialized TV shows that used to run from September through May on network television. Like, I don't know why, but the first one that comes to mind is The Nanny. (laughs) I guess I just have Fran Drescher on the brain. I love The Nanny, and I rewatched it a couple of months back. But... It just suddenly popped in my mind when I thought about that. So I guess I looked at TV Guide for that a lot as a kid. That was weird. But things like that. And then you have other people who who like the, the binging format, really. So I'm a fan of both. I think it depends on the style of the show and the story that's being told. So I will reassess that after I've finished and give y'all my final verdict on it from my personal point of view. But I would love to hear from you guys about how you think it's going on Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram. Hit us up at GSMC Sci-Fi and let's argue or agree. It's more interesting when we disagree. But overall, I'm open to arguments as I move forward in making my personal decision. So for this episode, there is quite a bit going on. We get to see more of Black Noir without really learning anything more about Black Noir. There's a lot going on this season. We're learning a lot about a lot of different characters, old and new. But Black Noir just really seems to almost be getting left in the dust in this one. We'll we'll talk about it. We're also going to talk about Maeve's new Brave Maeve gay campaign. We're going to talk about Ashley trying to corral Homelander and be the new Stilwell of Vaught, as well as the outcome of Billy finding out that Becca is again choosing Ryan over him. There's a lot going on. We're going to talk about the Deep getting married and being in that cult as well, and go from there. 
Stick around to our final segment where we'll talk about that scene with Stormfront and Homelander. If you've already seen it, you know what I'm talking about. If you haven't seen it yet, why are you listening to this before you've watched the episode? Go watch the episode and come back. First up, we are going to talk about how this episode really opens up. There's a lot going on for both Billy and Homelander. I think that they are similar in many different respects, and this season is drawing a lot of those parallels that we saw first hints of in season one. So they are both feeling very alone right now. Their purpose feels different. They're kind of adrift in general. So it's a lot like that concept, no man is an island. So even though Homelander feels that he's superior than everyone else, he still feels alone. And it reminds me of that scene in Ally McBeal where she is saying that whenever she's felt the most alone in her life, there were normally people sitting beside her. And that loneliness doesn't necessarily mean that you're not around other people. It's an internal feeling of just not being understood more so than anything else. Not being seen, really. And that's how Homelander feels. And for Billy, Becca was the only one who really, I guess, saw him. She's the only one he was vulnerable enough with to be his full self. I don't know how much of the murdering and stuff Becca knows about, but I would assume that she probably knows a fair bit considering her reaction to Billy and the child and saying that she knows Billy, that he would try to ditch Ryan as soon as possible if Becca did bring Ryan with her to run away right then. And that's pretty telling for me. She knows who he is deep down as a person. She might not know all of the details about his escapades with M.M. and Frenchie, but I don't think she's as in the dark as M.M.'s partner was. But she also doesn't seem to be as in on it as Frenchie's ex, Cherie, was. Well, is she an ex? Is she a paramour? I'm not sure about Cherie, really. The last time we saw her, she had to run off because Homelander was coming to find Translucent and she had to detonate their house to distract Homelander. And that was way back in season one. Now, Mother's Milk's wife i think she's i think they're married his wife slash his partner she knew about his history with frenchie and with billy because she was mad when he got involved in it again so she knows somewhat of it but i think that overall becca's involvement and knowledge and reaction to it are all somewhere in between those two women between Cherie and between M.M.'s partner. And then if we throw Huey and Starlight into the mix, we get a pretty full spectrum of reactions from the people involved and their partners. So I think that that's really cool, the way that that lines up with Cherie being more on the dark side of things and not caring really morally what she's assigning people to do, whereas... Starlight goes to arrest Huey the first time she really finds out about his involvement because she thinks that that is the right thing. And then she somewhat reluctantly gets involved with the rest of what the boys have going on. At certain points, she seems very scared for them and at others kind of horrified with herself for what she's done this season. So that's a really fun exercise in semiotics. But we did an entire episode on the semiotic square in Star Wars and the Lion King, and y'all, it took a full episode to break all that down. So we're not going to do one of those today, but I just found it really interesting to think about, and I wanted to put that out there in case y'all are also into semiotics. Now, I know I left Kimiko out, but Kimiko and Frenchie aren't quite together. It looks like they're going to be endgame, but... They're not quite together, and Cherie was already included in that, so I didn't include Kimiko. Don't think that I forgot her. It's just 
she's very similar in some ways to Cherie, and Cherie already fills that spot on the spectrum. But also, I feel that Kimiko is going to be more of one of those alternative positions on the semiotic square. But Kimiko has also just suffered a huge loss. She's lost her brother, and that was her reason for going forward and for living, just like Billy's was Becca. Now she doesn't have any plans for her future, just like Billy. They are both adrift, and I'm interested to see how they're going to deal with that. Huey is also in a similar boat. He joined up to avenge the death of his girlfriend, Robin. But now he's really put that ball in motion, and there's nothing he can do to stop it. It's way beyond Billy and Huey and any of the boys' control at this point. It's beyond Starlight as well. Even though she is one of the seven, it's beyond her. And there's nothing they can do to stop this. So now he's having to just live with it. So he hasn't really thought beyond that purpose either. So a lot of them had an initial purpose that has now been yanked out from under them this season. And it's really sad to watch, but I think that's why I love it so much. My favorite movies are always the ones that don't end the way that you want them to, like Moulin Rouge and things like that, or Rogue One. So this is really fun for me. I know, it's it's not nice, but it's it's exciting. It's like a lot of those dystopian movies. The word for it's not quite schadenfreude, but it's probably somewhere in there. There's got to be a French or a German word for this. It feels more like it would be more French, I think. But somewhere in there is a name for this feeling that I have in watching these people come up against these terrible odds and come through the other side. And I like how dark they make it in the boys. They say it's always darkest before the dawn, but we, you know, actually have dawn and darkness as a repetitive cycle, and it just keeps getting darker. And then we have a glimpse of dawn, and nope, it's just more darkness. So I am really enjoying the cyclical nature of that that actually does mirror how that works in real life. And these characters are all dealing with it in different ways, and that's largely what this episode is about, is how these characters are dealing with their plans going awry, and about managing expectations in general, which is really interesting to me, since the entire format of the show has been changed this season, and as I discussed earlier, I think a lot of it is down to subverting expectations and that's why it's been so polarizing so that's kind of hilarious that that's happening with the actual show but it's just that exact type of meta thing that makes the boys so fun it's also what made stargate really fun for me so who knows if this is intentional or not i suppose we'll find out when we see what they decide to do with season three for now, we're going to go on a quick break, and when we come back, we're going to talk about the fallout of Homelander outing Queen Maeve and Elena. Stay tuned. Want to find out what movies to go see? Then check out the GSMC Movie Podcast. It's your ticket to the latest movies, whether it's a new blockbuster event, romantic, comedy, or action flick. This show has got it all covered. They talk some what to go see now. Don't bother. What's hot on Netflix and everything in between? That's gsmcpodcast.com backslash movie dash podcast. When it's all about the movies, it has to be this new show. Don't forget to like them on Facebook and follow them on Twitter. Visit gsmcpodcast.com for more info. Welcome back. Before the break, we were introducing where we are in Season 2, Episode 5 of The Boys, 
And that's pretty much the no man is an island trope. So everyone is figuring out that they are going to need help. They can't do all this on their own. And they're searching for new purposes and meanings and reasons for living now that a lot of their old motivations have fallen away. Although the circumstances are different for each of them, Homelander killed Stillwell himself and then found a very interesting release with these recreations of his time with Stillwell via Doppelganger and then killed himself. He killed Doppelganger while Doppelganger looked at him as himself. Or rather, as Homelander. Then we see that Becca has been taken from Billy, but because Becca walked away herself and chose Ryan. And Kimiko's relationship with her brother was cut short right after being reunited because Vaught needed a scapegoat. And they found that in Kimiko's brother. And Stormfront went ahead and straight up killed him at the end of that episode. So regardless of why these characters are now divorced from their meaning and their sense of purpose, they are having absolute crises. Crises of conscience, crises of self, and their identity. And that looks different for all of them. Some of them get harder, some of them get softer, some just flounder and flail quite a bit. So it's a lot of fun exploring the different possible reactions to this situation with these characters this season. Now, we're going to catch up with Queen Maeve and Elena now that Homelander has outed Queen Maeve on national television. Perhaps even international television, I'm not sure. But now everyone knows that Maeve is also into women. So in the last episode, Homelander told everyone while they were on air and she was not prepared for it at all. He gave her no heads up about it. And he did that intentionally as a sick power play. It was super uncool of him. But, you know, that's Homelander in a nutshell. So now she's having to deal with that. And the fallout of that, since she is one of the seven and she works for Vought is that they want to go ahead and spin it into this super popular pro-women narrative that they're already spinning with their Dawn of the Seven movie and the Girls Get It Done new promotional campaign. So they've not consulted Maeve on this at all, though. And that's the problem. So they're supporting it, but not because they're actually supportive of her, but rather they're looking at this and going, hey, this is a new demographic that we can appeal to because none of the other superheroes are canonically gay, and we're going to go ahead and capitalize on this. If they actually had talked to Maeve about it and discussed with her how she wanted to handle it, that would come across a lot different. But in this case... In true Ashley and the PR team style, they are just running with it and spinning further narratives about her life. And the dialogue for it is not great. The dialogue of the show The Boys itself is stellar. I mean the dialogue of the movie Dawn of the Seven within the TV show The Boys. So we start this episode with seeing the scene in Dawn of the Seven where Maeve is pulling a woman out of some rubble after a battle, after something terrible happened. And their whole dialogue has a ton of lesbian subtext in it. And then Maeve outright expositionally says, I'm a lot like you. I'm gay. Y'all know how I feel about exposition. And I love that they are poking fun of it in this way. It is very true to how it often comes out. It makes it seem awkward, and we already understood what was happening. And there are ways to outright say that you're gay or that, you know, that's what's going on with the story without going through all the subtext first and then also overtly saying it. There's a lot going on. Now, I'm all for representation in media. Let me be the first to say that. I am really happy with just overt text rather than subtext. This is mainly poking fun of the ways that people decide to tell this. And it 
also serves to further represent how out of touch that Ashley and them are with Maeve as an actual person rather than just who she is as a character. And it's a tricky situation that Maeve and the other soups are really in because they are celebrities. So they're living this weird public-private life, private-public life. I'm not sure which one comes first. Probably the public one, as far as Ashley's concerned anyway. So part of Maeve is Maeve, and the other part of her is Maggie, the person she was before she became the character Queen Maeve and put on that mantle. Maggie's still the person she is when she goes home at night. And she's willing to give Ashley the finger about the press tour, but there's only so much balking against the system that one can do with Vought. And we see that done in different ways by Maeve and Annie and also A-Train this season. Black Noir seems to stay in line. Everyone else, though, seems like they are floundering in some aspect, whether that is them threatening to let A-Train go and just telling him, hey man, it is what it is, and him trying to hold on to his career in the Seven, or the Deep trying to get back into the Seven. Maeve seems to almost be trying to get out of the Seven, so now that she's out of the closet, she's also kind of trying to get out of the Seven, and we see Annie realizing that the system is not what she thought it was and trying to take it apart from the inside. And Homelander is failing in a lot of his popularity polls. But Homelander has a little bit more control over what happens than Maeve and the others do. So once the scene wraps with her telling the other character, I'm a lot like you, I'm gay, then Maeve visits Homelander and he's watching the production reel, and says that he's supportive of her and everything. But it's very clear that he's not happy about it. I don't know how Homelander feels about homosexuality. That's kind of fuzzy because of his relationship with Doppelganger and making Doppelganger dress as Stillwell and then Doppelganger deciding to become Homelander himself. And Homelander seemed into it up until he killed him, but I can't tell if he was killing him out of joy or out of being upset. Could go either way. Regardless, Homelander is not jazzed about what's going on. I think it's more of a possessiveness, though, than anything else. I don't think it's necessarily homophobia. I'm not sure that Homelander even cares about that. But it seems like something Stormfront would probably care about. And I'm interested to see how that develops as we go along. I'm a little surprised we haven't seen a confrontation on that yet. But Maeve isn't as nice as Annie and may not put up with it as much. So perhaps Stormfront is just dealing with Starlight right now and deciding how she's going to deal with Maeve once she handles the problem at hand. Stormfront is here to play the long game, and so she does not seem concerned about Maeve in any way, and Maeve has been spending so much time with Elena and also with filming Dawn of the Seven and different scenes that aren't necessarily simultaneous or sharing the scene with Stormfront, that perhaps they just haven't had a lot of time together up to now. She's also, Stormfront that is, getting some more time with A-Train. So we're getting to see them peel back a little bit at a time. Now, once she goes to talk to Homelander, Ashley interrupts them so that she can show Homelander a video of him killing these foreign terrorists with his lasers. So he's lasered someone to death and is very blasé about it. But unfortunately, it's been caught on camera. And so now it's gone viral, and a lot of people are really upset about that. He's down 9.5 points in his approval ratings. And Homelander can't really handle people not loving him. So he is really unhappy about this, and it's finally starting to kind of light a fire under his butt. But not necessarily in a way that is good for the rest of humanity. 
And you can really get a good sense of his derision for these people, too, when he says the quote, So what? They're all starving, but one of them's got a cell phone? And in this case, he seems more concerned about the fact that one of these people that was present when he killed this foreign terrorist has a cell phone rather than the fact that they're starving. As Homelander, he would probably be able to help them out with getting food and stuff, but he's uninterested in that. He's only interested in killing people, and he would rather deride folks for having access to what he deems to be something that they don't deserve because they don't have more money than he is about them getting food. In my opinion, it's not all that surprising, not just because of what we know about Homelander, but also what we know about Homelander's base of fans and how they tend to be more conservative and how he's a symbol of white supremacy in a way, very similar to how Stormfront is, but a different facet of it. And I've heard that comment a lot from a lot of conservatives, people saying, oh, well, this person doesn't look homeless or this person can afford a cell phone, but they can't afford food. I'm not giving them money. Things like that. And it's important to think about those contexts. It bothers me a lot as a human being when people say that because it is taking a lot of assumptions into account and labeling values on a lot of people. You don't know if someone was gifted that cell phone by someone in one of these cars that go by and give money. People don't always just give money. Sometimes it's food. Sometimes it's gift cards. It's something of value. One of my friends actually takes her old Ipsy bags with her and she fills them with feminine hygiene products and things like that and puts them in a bigger bag along with some snacks. And then she hands these out to homeless women whenever she comes into contact with them. If she has razors and stuff, she might put razors in there so that they can shave, things like that. Also, if you were homeless, as a thought exercise, if someone gave you enough money to go and have a nice, safe, clean, warm motel room for the night and told you exactly to go do that, and that's the purpose for it, I'm not saying that homeless people need to use your money for what you tell them to use it for. That's infantilizing, and I'm totally against that. But I am saying that this is also a similar scenario where I've heard people say, hey, this is what this is this money is for. And then that person goes and does that and they take a shower and maybe wash their clothes out in the sink or in the bathroom or someone donates some clothes to them or they use a couple dollars and go to Goodwill and pick up some more clothes. And now they don't look dirty anymore because someone gave them enough for a brief reprieve from this. If I was homeless, I could totally see that happening. I could totally see going, you know what? I just want to feel safe and warm for one night and I could really use a bath. So I'm going to go ahead and do that tonight. But when homeless people do that and they bathe in a river or anywhere else, a lot of people think, well, they're not dirty enough to be homeless. And that's really messed up. That's very similar to what Homelander's saying. I've also seen people go, well, that person has a cell phone, so they don't need money, clearly. That's not how that works. There are pay-as-you-go plans and all kinds of stuff that are out there for people who have less money than everyone else. You don't know their story. You don't know exactly what's going on in their lives. And there's a lot of assumptions that go into comments like that. And I really appreciate them having the character of Homelander say that because he is so problematic that it helps underline how problematic that statement really is. We're going to go on a quick break. And when we come back, we're going to talk about how Ashley wants him to handle it versus how he does handle it and how Billy is doing post Becca turning him down to run away. Stay tuned. Tired of searching the vast jungle of podcasts? Now listen close and hear this out. 
There's a podcast network that covers just about everything that you've been searching. Hey! The Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network is here. Nothing less than a podcast bliss with endless hours of podcast coverage. From news, sports, music, fashion, cooking, entertainment, fantasy, football, and so much more. So stop lurking around and go straight out to the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network. Guaranteed to fill that podcast itch. Whatever it may be, visit us at www.gsmcpodcast.com. Follow us on Facebook and Twitter and download us on iTunes, SoundCloud, and Google Play. Welcome back. Before the break, we were talking about Homelander and his fan base, as well as Queen Maeve and her new gay campaign. It's called Brave, hashtag Brave Maeve, I believe is what it is, and how Ashley and them are putting her through that. So they're doing their, I suppose, damage control, although they seem more jazzed about it than anything. For Maeve, they're they're spinning this in the way that they want it. And now that Homelander has been seen killing a foreign terrorist with his laser eyes and not really caring about it one way or the other because this is his day job, Ashley is also trying to spin that debacle and help find a better outcome for this terrible situation they're in. So, I mean, Ashley's really stepped into a mess They are down a suit because Translucent's not there, and now they've also got the Deep over in Ohio, Sandusky, Ohio, so they were the five already, and then, you know, now they're deciding to put Stormfront in there, but they are still missing a person, and you also need to make sure everybody's engaged, but Maeve is kind of disengaging, and something's going on with A-Train, it looks like they're pushing him out, so... There's a lot of chaos going on with just replacing people, and it's just like a presidential cabinet change or any other type of regime change. There's all these spots on the 7 that have gone empty within Ashley stepping into this governing role for it, and it's a lot to do. She's more comfortable with the PR stuff, so that's mostly what she's handling, especially since Homelander has outright threatened her. And she's pretty freaked by that, and rightfully so. So poor Ashley is having to deal with all this, but it also reminds me a lot, actually, of Supreme Court nominations and also appointments to a new president's cabinet. So whenever you have that regime change, you have a lot of changes that go into deciding who's going to be your counselor for which things. Some people don't get changed at all, and others get changed completely due to ideological reasons. And with this new Supreme Court Justice, Amy Coney Barrett, having been confirmed this past day, it is heavy on my mind. So Mr. Edgar was always in charge, ultimately. Madeline did everything that she did excellently, so he didn't have to micromanage her, but he still had final say on anything if he wanted to. But now he's more directly involved, and Ashley is doing her best, but is also having to deal with Homelander on the other side. She's kind of a ping-pong ball caught between Mr. Edgar and Homelander. So who really has the reins on this? I'm not sure. Is Stormfront working for Mr. Edgar or with Mr. Edgar, or is he working for her ultimately? I am very confused about where that's heading, but I like that because that means there's still some mystery in there. So ultimately, who is appointing these people to the Seven? I'm not entirely sure, to be honest. Ashley seemed to have an idea, and I suppose Mr. Edgar approved it, but Mr. Edgar also seems to intuitively know who Homelander is as a person and how he is, so... 
I would not be surprised if they use that guy as a pawn to sacrifice him, essentially, knowing that Homelander might react any potential way possible, and then gauging from that how strong their response needed to be. Mr. Edgar and Stormfront are characters who seem to play chess, and Homelander isn't even really playing checkers. He's more like, it's like he's playing bowling, really. Like, Homelander's bowling, the rest of them are playing chess. It is an odd combination that I live for. But even though Homelander gives Ashley a hard time, he's ultimately not in control. Ashley tries to help him with the response he should give to the outcry about him just callously killing this person and saying, hey, you need to do a no comment at this time, and then we're going to do an acknowledgement, apology, and action. Which is very similar to how a lot of PR firms really do run. That's a pretty popular PR response. It's also what they had the deep do. And it was more noticeable with the deep up to the action part. So that part was Vought taking action rather than the deep. They just moved him somewhere and were hoping people would forget about him until they could go ahead and replace him, it seems. I'm not entirely sure what Madeline's long game was for it. And I suppose we'll never know now that she is dead. But Homelander is not going to listen to Madeline's directive. They're not going to be taking that approach because he doesn't care what they have to say. And Stormfront tells him, you know, hey, I know how to handle this and I'm here when you want me. And as soon as she used that phrasing, I knew where we were going. But we'll talk about that in our fourth segment. Now, meanwhile, at a music club or a dance club or a bar or something, Billy's at some kind of music venue and is smoking cigarettes and drinking a lot of booze and then heads to the mosh pit area so that he can start a fight. But it doesn't seem that he really wants to beat up other people. He wants the absolute crap kicked out of him instead. And he seems pretty content to handle this. If Billy just wanted to beat up some people, he could have just picked a small fight outside with some bikers or something. But Billy decided to get his butt, like, literally kicked. Like, he's on the ground in the fetal position. But weirdly, very happy about it while he is literally getting kicked by a bunch of people in this crowd because he's gone too far in the mosh pit. But I think Billy really just needs to feel something right now. He feels absolutely devastated and dead inside and has lost his reason for being. He's lost his purpose and everything. And before he knew Becca was alive, there at the end, he was willing to just die. He thought that she was dead and he was going to die trying to take Homelander out with him. But he also knew that Homelander very well might survive that bomb. So it was really more about Billy killing himself in a flashy fashion and trying to take Homelander out with him, if at all possible. Now he is absolutely floundering and he doesn't know what to do. He's not even at the point where he's necessarily going to kill himself anymore. This is uncharted territory for Billy. I don't think that ever in a million years would he have envisioned the possibility that he would find Becca and she would not want to come back with him. But Billy's out buying some frozen peas or something to put on his beaten up face when he gets a call from Huey. Now, frankly, I am surprised that Billy does not have broken ribs at this point, considering that everyone was kicking the crap out of him on the ground. Like, at least eight people made contact with their shoes on Billy. It's a metal concert. I'm sure lots of these people wearing boots, maybe even steel-toed boots. And he, he got the crap kicked out of him, you guys. But he seems fine in that capacity. Doesn't have much wrong with him other than, you know, a bunch of bruising and, and blood. But I was expecting, like, some missing teeth or something. Now I get it. Missing teeth are not typically considered to be super sexy. So maybe they decided not to do that to Carl Urban because he's underground and doesn't have time to find a dentist at this point in season two. Who knows? I thought he was a little bit uh, 
less messed up than he should have looked after all that, especially considering how quickly he went down because he wanted to get his butt kicked rather than get anybody else. But Huey calls Billy while he is out there picking up something frozen to help with the pain and the swelling of his wounds on his face. And Huey admits to Billy that he's not mad at him for putting Becca first, that he understands why Billy hit him and why Billy had to leave to go and try to find Becca. And that's a really big point for the two of them. But then he also lets Billy know what they found out. And that is that on that road trip, Starlight and Huey and M.M. found out that Stormfront is Liberty, who appears to be an immortal racist. Now, she's definitely a racist. The appears part is for the immortal component. So we're not entirely sure how old Liberty slash Stormfront is actually is, but they've been around for a really long time. They were already an adult and part of the Precursor to the Seven in the 50s. So they've been around a very, very long time. So they may well be an immortal racist. And Huey also tells Billy that it's very likely that Stormfront is responsible for Susan's murder. Now, the head exploding thing, that doesn't seem to be one of Stormfront's powers, but they think that she was the driving force behind it, especially seeing as Susan's file had notes about Liberty and stuff in there. So while they're doing this, Billy's also shopping for a pet toy, and that seems to be a little bit out of left field because we haven't seen a dog except for in his episodes that were flashbacks to Becca. So you're like, what the heck? But he's he's getting a dog toy, I suppose. And then he tells Huey that he was always like his canary, like a canary in a coal mine, alerting him that, you know, he's maybe gone too far, things like that. And he then says he's going to get off the grid and he leaves and he crushes that SIM card so no one can follow him. And Billy was just very nice, really, at that point, which is a red flag for Huey. And he communicates that to Mother's Milk, who also is like, that is definitely a red flag. Where is he? So they go off to find him. And it turns out that he is at the house of his aunt and says he doesn't want to talk to his parents. So we know that Billy's parents are alive, but that his dad has a terminal cancer. But he mostly just wants to be at his Aunt Judy's house to hang with Judy because she seems pretty cool with Billy. But also, she's been keeping his bulldog, Terror. So the bulldog that we saw with him and Becca before is still alive and his aunt has had him for a while. So Billy goes to take Terror for a walk and opens up to the dog about his loss of meaning in life. And he's like, you know, I spent nine years trying to do all this. And like, why, why did I do that? All that effort I put in there, all of the terrible things that I've done and have been done to me, all the loss that's happened for me and the people around me, Mallory's grandkids and everything. And for why? Like, why was I involved in this at all? Because she doesn't even want to come with me. So it's a lot for him, but it's nice to see him talking to the dog. And when he gets back from the walk, he sees Mother's Milk and Huey there. So they figured out that he was visiting the dog at his aunt's house. And they won't leave without him. So he goes to leave. But when he starts to back up the car, he sees Black Noir watching in the rearview mirror. And so he goes back in the house and tells everybody. And there's nothing much they can really do. They start closing the blinds so he at least can't see them and creating booby traps. But, I mean, we think Black Noir can't see everyone. Who knows if he has infrared or anything else in there. We can't see any of his face. I don't know if his goggles do anything other than make sure we can't see his eyes. So they do all of this, and then they know they're not going to be able to leave. And Billy wants to go out there and fight him himself, but they're not leaving without him, and they're not going to let him sacrifice himself that way. They understand that he is in a deeply depressed and vulnerable state following this huge loss of a concept of a shared future with Becca. So they're not going to let him do that because that is definitely 
a suicide mission. It's not going to protect them really from Black Noir. It's just going to get Billy killed. So they go ahead and go to hide in the basement. And Mother's Milk calls in a gas leak scare. So that way, Black Noir can't come in there right then and kill them all. They are able to be protected because there's so much media and firemen and stuff there. So remember, the rest of the world doesn't know that the Vought 7 are, some of them at least, bad guys. That they kill people when it's unnecessary and things like that. They still think that they're above board authoritarian figures. And that's still super problematic. And it's very similar to how a lot of folks feel about police officers nowadays. So they go ahead and make sure that he at least can't get them while they're waiting there. And I've seen this trick played out before on Stargate SG-1 when Mayborn and Jack go to Senator Kinsey's house and Kinsey wants to send the NID in them after them, but he's having a really big party at his house. And so Jack and Mayborn end up calling the cops and stuff over to Kinsey's so that they can walk out casually and leave because that would be bad press for Kinsey's re-election and they use that against him. So this is very similar to that, and I delighted in it. That's one of my favorite scenes from Stargate. And normally I'm not super into the episodes with Kenzie, but that was just so well played by Jack and Mayborn that I loved it. And these guys are wily like that too. So they call in a gas leak scare and fill the neighborhood with a presence of a lot of people who could take pictures of them. Even if it's not firemen, the neighbors will all be out there looking at everything, and everyone has cell phones nowadays, as Homelander already lamented earlier. The boys do end up still having to confront Black Noir later on, and the dog gives away where they are. It's okay, Terror. Still the goodest boy. But they end up getting knifed, so Mother's Milk gets a dagger, in him, and then Huey's about to be absolutely crushed by Black Noir when Billy tells Black Noir that if he kills them, then they automatically are going to send out media from the cloud to the media of Becca and Ryan existing so that everyone will know that Homelander has raped someone and also that that's resulted in a child. So Right now, Ryan is a super top-secret government experiment. He wasn't intentionally created, but they're definitely capitalizing on that and holding them all prisoner. After all, Homelander didn't know about them until a little bit ago, so it wasn't Homelander holding them captive for the past nine years. It was the government. So this is something they really don't want. And by the government, I don't really mean the government proper, I don't think. It's bought. It's this capitalist government, business, military, industrial complex conglomerate type creature that is really keeping them from telling them stuff. So he knows it would be bad PR, and Billy is telling this to Black Noir. But when he does this, Black Noir actually has a camera in his armor, and we see that that's revealed when Mr. Edgar calls Billy and starts talking to him. And he's saying, hey, you know, I heard everything that you just said, and I'll let you go if you get rid of that evidence. Black Noir won't kill you as long as you don't release that info. So how about that? They probably don't have actual evidence of it. They just have the location, and that's about it. He couldn't even convince Becca to leave with him, so they don't necessarily have actual evidence of that. Also, it's a very ballsy move, considering that the best way to get rid of that evidence would just be to kill Ryan and Becca. And Billy's really banking hard on the fact that they're not going to want to cut their losses on that so soon. So this kid's a longitudinal study. He's only nine years old right now. They don't know what's going to happen with him as he grows older because he's the first superhero that has been born and not made. 
the Black Noir, under Mr. Edgar's orders, ends up letting them go. We're going to go on a quick break, and when we come back, we are going to wrap up where Starlight and Stormfront and Maeve, A-Train, everyone else is. We're going to talk about where everyone else is. We'll be back in just a moment. Watching TV has changed over time. Streaming has become the new norm. That's why Golden State Media Concepts Television Podcast dives headfirst to the world of cord cutting. Want to be on the loop of what's hot in Netflix? Or if it's not a preference, what about original shows in Hulu? We've got you covered. Join us as we fill in the blanks and talk about movies to stream and what show you should be binging. This is the Golden State Media Concepts Television Podcast. Welcome back. Before the break, we were talking about Billy and how he is trying to blackmail Black Noir only for Mr. Edgar to call him and tell him that he'll let him go if they don't release any of that footage. For Mr. Edgar, I mean, that's about as good as it gets. He's going to have some more time to think about what to do, and I am afraid of where that's going. It seems that Black Noir works directly for Mr. Edgar, I don't really know, though. He's giving me vibes like the mountain did when the mountain worked for Cersei after she turned him into, like, the zombie form of the mountain. Black Noir seems to just do what he's told. He seems very much like an automaton, just like the mountain and just like the wind-up guy from Hellboy. I've really got to Google that character's name keep talking about him and I don't remember his name but you know who I'm talking about so that's where we were at and now we're going to catch up with the rest of the characters so we still don't know anything more about Black Noir other than that he has a body cam on and that Mr. Edgar is able to see everything he does and respond in real time Keep in mind, this was not just anyone who picked up. We know they have tons of technicians in there, but this was Mr. Edgar himself. So I also wonder if Black Noir is even human underneath all that. I don't know if that would pop up with Homelander, though, since Homelander has that super hearing and can definitely hear people's pulses and like count their heart rate and everything really quickly. I don't know what would go on there, but I guess we'll find out later on. I like that they're building the mystery of Black Noir, though. So a lot of people have expressed some dissatisfaction with him not getting more screen time or knowing more about him. And they're like, we're not, we're not learning anything. Nothing's building. They are building. They're building anticipation. And I am stoked to see where they end up taking it. So with Billy and the boys now leaving from uh, their Aunt Judy, or rather Billy's Aunt Judy, he gets the dog, Terror, a little Homelander toy because the dog likes to hump a lot of stuffed animals. And so the dog gets all over that Homelander toy. And Billy is very childishly amused by that. There are some jokes that will always be funny, I suppose, like fart jokes. And Billy is just really amused by this in what's otherwise a really dark time for him. His dog's still bringing him joy, and I think that's beautiful and sweet. Kimiko has started killing for hire, so she's a mercenary right now in her grief. And there is actually an anthropological story that's associated with that in my mind. So in school, I majored in anthropology, and we read this article written by an anthropologist named Renato Rizzaldo, and it was called Grief and a Headhunter's Rage. And it was about Rizzaldo's experience in the Philippines amongst the Ilongot people. 
and part of their rituals and their culture was that they beheaded people in celebratory rituals that were related to grief. And he couldn't really understand that at first while he was over there. He couldn't get why people would really go on these hunts to go and behead other people just because they were sad. But during his excursion to the Philippines, his wife died. And that emotional impact really helped bridge that gap between the observer and the culture he was observing. That emotional component for Rosaldo, in his own words, helped him to understand the reasons why people did it and the motivations that stem from grief. So he is understanding because his wife is dead and he doesn't have anywhere to place those feelings that it's easier to turn it into rage and how cathartic that can be to have some sort of resolution to the emotions that you're carrying that are super heavy. And he uses it for an argument for going towards more of an emotional understanding in addition to an intellectual one. Traditionally with ethnography, like going and watching another culture and writing about it, there's a lot of detachment involved historically in anthropology. And so for Renato Rosaldo, this was a brand new approach for looking at it. He was for once not able to understand something as a cultural anthropologist and an outsider with the detachment. And it was only when he became attached to the subject that he was able to truly experience it. It's a really great article told in his own words. So if you guys are interested, that is Renato Rosaldo's article, Grief and a Headhunter's Rage. And you can find that for free online. That's very similar to how we find Kimiko in this episode. She has a rage born from grief, as the Alongut and Renato Rosaldo refer to it. This is her way of carrying her grief and carrying her anger. She is distraught at this loss of purpose in her life and motivation and love, the loss of her brother, who she had had to kind of imprison with the boys to hand over, but he ultimately came back for her. He protected her and saved her when they were running from Vought in the tunnels and subsequently on the rooftops. The reason that he's dead is because Stormfront was going to kill her and he came back for her. So she has a lot of guilt and survivor's guilt as well. She also has a lot of grief surrounding him turning to Shining Light and embracing that ideology. And she it just feels like she's lost her brother in so many different ways over the years. And this is too much for her. And it's easier to take that spirit of vengeance up. Just like that's how Huey started stepping into being who he truly was instead of worrying about other people. It was Robin's death and his subsequent rage that helped him make that decision and started moving him along in his life. It helped him to understand Billy in many ways too. But that headhunter rage is what Billy has just lost. So he's lost his vehicle for carrying his anger and his grief because he's found Becca actually alive and she won't come with him. So we see Kimiko starting down the path that Billy was already far down by the time we met him in season one. And this is super alarming for Frenchie. He's seen this happen to people and he does not want to see that happen to somebody else he loves. And he does deeply love Billy. I think that he and M.M. both do, or they would not have gotten involved in these shenanigans with him again to begin with. They were all still quite upset with each other at the beginning of this when Billy reunited the boys. And I don't think that this is another loss that Frenchie is willing to take and that he is capable of taking with his own heart. But that's where Kimiko is heading. And so he finds her in a church with Cherie, Frenchie's old paramour. And Cherie is giving Kimiko hitman assignments from the Albanians. 
Frenchie's really upset with her about that, at both of them, and he wants Kimiko to stop. And he tells her, you know, this is poison for your soul. I know that. And she gets mad at him and doesn't want to go along with him or stop what she's doing because she's mid headhunter rage. She's mid grief. And so Frenchie tells her to go and be a monster then. And he leaves. I think both of their perspectives on this really tug at the heartstrings. I can understand in some ways how Kimiko would want to turn that into rage and just be angry all the time instead of feeling the pain. Now, whether that's from grief, from the loss of a friend or a partner or a family member, or from the loss of a sense of self or a part of yourself from some sort of event that was traumatic in your life, like what happened with Annie slash Starlight, when her idea of what being one of the seven was ripped away when the deep sexually assaulted her, and how that slowly grew into a rage until she went off on people on national television. She went off on her mom, she went off on the deep, she went off on Vought, and just kind of lost it a little bit. That's very similar to the headhunter's rage, but she is somewhere else on that spectrum. For her, headhunting isn't an outlet for it, but she's done kind of a symbolic equivalent of it in outing everyone at the Believe Expo. But by viewing it through the grief and a headhunter's rage lens, that scene really got me. Frenchie just being distraught about having to watch somebody else go down that alley and also having probably been down it himself, in addition to having seen Billy do it. It's just too much for him. And he's tried everything he can to help her. But she's trying to communicate with him now. But he can't understand her because she's talking with her hands in a language that seemed to be something just between she and her brother. It doesn't appear to be ASL or anything like that from what I've gathered in the show. So he's still just as confused. And so he gets more frustrated and she gets more frustrated. And they get more angry as that frustration and the grief builds into anger. And it's explosive. But it's also not quite gutting. But it did really tug on my heartstrings. I don't have a better way to put that right now. I didn't cry or anything. I'm not um, prone to bouts of weeping. No judgment on people who are. I love it when people feel their full feelings. And Frenchie would also support the heck out of that. But I, I did feel it deeply. And if you haven't read Grief and a Headhunter's Rage, highly recommend it. So she decides to go and do that. And they part ways. But eventually, I think that she'll stop. I don't think that she's going to continue down this path. Her rage burns brightly. But it's going to burn out quicker, I think, than Billy's did because Billy's rage was a stew, right? And hers is more of a flash fire. So this just happened to her and was really quick. And she has the means with her new powers to go ahead and kill people right now. She has means to kill people who are involved in it right now. Whereas Billy had to wait for years for vengeance for Becca. Ultimately, Kimiko will still want to kill Stormfront for what she's done. But I think she's going to have a long time to think this out before it gets there. It'll be extended out, but I think she's going to be more strategic about it than Billy once she gets past this initial stage of rage. We also see a train getting booted from the seven. So just like they wrote Maeve's sexuality into the story of the dawn of the seven. So the movie within the show, they're doing the same thing with a train's exit. They've decided that since Homelander definitely peeped him in the tunnels, having to catch his breath and everything and having heart trouble following his abuse of compound V that they're going to go ahead and get rid of him. They're going to replace him with someone who is also fast and just call it a day. They're going to do a one-for-one -one swap. It reminds me of what they call the dick switch in the TV show Bewitched. And it's not as dirty as it sounds. It's not dirty at all, in fact. 
So after season five in Bewitch, they replaced the guy who played Darren, the husband. And originally it was played by Dick York, and he was replaced by Dick Sargent. So that's why they call it the Dick Switch, because they were both had the same first name. But they just changed out a main character in the middle of a show. And a lot of people just rolled with it. And that's what they are saying they're going to do to A-Train. It's just like the Dick Switch. Well, except for the part where Dick York, I believe, was actually really ill at the time. He had a lot of uh, health issues going on and collapsed on set. And that's why they ultimately ended up needing to replace him. Although now that I think about it, that is really similar to what's happening with A-Train. I don't think that Dick York was necessarily fired, though. I'm not sure. I don't have all the information on that. I'm not going to pretend that I do. I won't lie to you guys. But uh, it it was because of health reasons. And so they replaced them with someone who was incredibly similar. And that seems to be what they are also referring to in this. At least from my perspective. So they're trying to work him out of this, though. And he's doing an exit from the seven, at least. And... They want him to say these lines, but he hates the dialogue for it, and he thinks it's too expositional, and I appreciated him saying that, but he also wanted to leave it a little bit more open-ended so he could perhaps come back sometime and give himself some wiggle room for figuring out what was going on here and find a way to stay in, but Ashley just tells him, hey, you can take your severance package and your dignity Or we can just fire you for breaching your contract's morality clause because you took Compound V as a street drug and you had a heart attack from it. So they're blackmailing him for being an addict. So Ashley, or Trashley, as I'm thinking of her from now on, is just as crappy as the rest of them. She just doesn't have superpowers. I enjoy Trashley as a character, But this is some hot garbage that she's doing to A-Train. Although, I highly suspect it's Mr. Edgar's orders. Ultimately, no one is going to leave Ashley fully in charge of anything. She's largely a sinecure, really. She gets status and money for this, and she gets some sort of feeling of being involved and important, but you can tell that there are other people a lot more involved in this than anyone was when Madeline was making decisions. But she goes ahead and with Mr. Edgar essentially backing her invisibly, Mr. Edgar's not present in the room or anything, she tells him what to do and he goes ahead and decides to do the scene as it is. And he sees his replacement inside of Vought. He's also having to work with Stormfront on this set And while they're talking about the Deep's commercial for the Church of the Collective, Stormfront says that she used to be a member of it back when it was still pure and gives him a look that seems to be implying that they started letting people of color in. And she says some people are quality and some are garbage. And then she mocks him. So it looks at first like she's saying people of color specifically black people since she's talking to A-Train. But over time in this episode, we see that she only cares about soups now. Or at least that's what she says when she's talking to Homelander. But that seems kind of suspect because she did say a racial slur as well when she killed Kimiko's brother. And he also had superpowers. So here we are. I think she's both. All of the above. She probably also hates people who are gay. I'm waiting for that showdown between her and Maeve. But she helps Homelander get his points back up after he tries to go and talk to the protesters, and they hate him. So she sits down with him. He finally comes to her trailer, and she sits down with him, and she shows him some memes that she's had somebody make for them, and that they're going to get these pro-Homelander memes out there to fix this. And in doing so, she gets his points back up by five points, I suppose. So he was down by 9.5, and then he's back up by five by the end of it. And that results in a very interesting interaction between the two of them, where they get into a super crazy, combative, super sex fight. So they're enjoying it. They're just breaking everything. 
and he lasers her in the chest by her request. And she's like, ah, that hurts. And so he stops and she goes, did I tell you to stop? Keep going. So she is apparently into like a soup version of BDSM and is really bringing him into this new realm of sexuality that he's not used to. He had some of like a mommy and little boy thing going on with Stillwell. Some age play seemed to be occurring, but this is wholly different. It makes him feel seen. It makes him feel understood in many ways and like he may have found an equal. But this also gives me very strong Marjorie Tyrell vibes. So I've also been recently watching Game of Thrones again from the beginning. We watched the first four seasons probably in a week. As one does when one binges shows that are already off the air. And so I just got to the scene recently where Santa is engaged to Tyrion. And so now Marjorie is engaged to Joffrey. And Marjorie and Elena ask, hey, you know, how is he? And they finally get out of Sansa that he's a monster, that Joffrey's a monster. And they don't seem all that upset about it. They're just like, oh, well, that's a shame. But at least they know what they're up against. And then Marjorie uses that knowledge to get Joffrey to like her by asking him to show her how to use the crossbow and having him show her like with his arms around her or also saying that, you know, she would maybe like to go hunting with him sometime if he thought that that would be okay and finding a point of contention with him by framing it as though her father would never let her do something like that. But now Joffrey is also in the role of her protector as her future husband. And he's like, well, you don't belong to your father anymore. So she's preying on his nature and his tendency to be very, you know, anti-feminist, to be very superior and elitist, just like Stormfront is doing with Homelander. In Marjorie's case, Marjorie was pretty cool and I liked her. She was one of my absolute favorites in the whole series and really was a good guy. She was using the influence she had with Joffrey to help make sure that people were fed and things like that. Whereas Stormfront is possibly quite worse than Homelander himself. So she is going full Marjorie Tyrell on him, though. I don't think that she fully believes everything that she's telling him. Because she also recognizes when Starlight is acting and calls her out on it. So I think that she also realizes that in order to get Homelander to do what she needs to do, she can work her way under his skin and get him to be influenced that way. Don't get me wrong, Maeve is no Sansa Stark, but Maeve was not able to entirely reach him in that way either. Because ultimately, he and Maeve are so different, but he and Stormfront are a lot alike, even if she is also manipulating him. She is way better at it than Stillwell was. And Maeve specifically could never, because that's just not how Maeve is. That's not her approach. Maeve, though, is ready to take Homelander down, though. She is fed up with him. Elena is getting really upset about this press tour and the fact that they want Elena to cut her hair and wear a pantsuit because people are more comfortable with gay relationships when it's very clear that there's some type of sexual demarcation in there. So one person in the relationship is, quote unquote, the man and the other one, the woman. So it's like a heterosexualization of homosexuality that makes heterosexuals more comfortable. And Maeve isn't fighting them on like any of this, but Elaine is new to it, so it's very upsetting. And Maeve decides, you know, she's not going to put up with this anymore, and that she will tell people that he's a good guy and try to help him get back on the seven if he will support her in the future in helping to get rid of Homelander. It's a really dicey play on her part. The Deep is super manipulable. 
Is that a word? So he's super easy to manipulate right now because there is something he definitely wants and there are multiple people who can help him get it. So that's really dicey to me. But she tells him that she'll help him. And she's not joining his church. She's like, no, I definitely don't want anything to do with that. But help me out with this and I'll help you out. Lastly, Stormfront is being messy in a more overt way with Starlight. She has stopped pretending to be this person who just says whatever she wants to, you know, appeal to millennials and things like that, and is just overtly calling her on it. She's like, I know that you did this with a compound V and you let everybody know, and you're going to be a big help to me. But what she means by that remains to be seen because Homelander walks in right then. And when he asks what's going on, she tells him, oh, you know, it's just between us girls. And Starlight's like, yep, and bounces out of there really quickly. So she's in a really compromised position right now, Starlight that is. But it's kind of like the concept of trying to quit the mafia. How does one quit the Vought 7? You don't want to be just kicked out. I mean, you could be kicked out, but they might kill you maybe for doing something so bad publicly and making them look bad that they would need to kick you out unless they can frame her as joining terrorists. Maybe they will since she's been seen with Huey and Billy and all of them. Maybe that's how they'll eventually get her out saying she's a turncoat. But that's not her getting out on her terms. That's her being pushed out on theirs. So she doesn't really have a way to get out of this in any safe capacity. But I think as much as the Deep wants back in, she definitely wants out. But she does not have a real recourse for that. And her allies are dwindling. The fact that Maeve is going to support the Deep in coming back to the Seven is super problematic since he sexually assaulted Annie, and Annie told him that she's never going to forgive him for this. So Maeve was the one she was closest with on this team, and now Maeve is supporting her abuser. So this is a really icky situation. And we see themes of that also mirrored in when Billy tells Mr. Edgar via Black Noir's camera and the phone call that he is going to forward that information to Ronan Farrow. He's going to forward the media about Becca and everything to Ronan Farrow because Ronan Farrow was largely involved in the Me Too movement, or he's deeply involved in the Me Too movement. There was a lot going on with his sister Dylan Farrow in regards to allegations made against their stepfather, Woody Allen, in which Dylan Farrow said that he had molested her while she was a child. And Ronan has also written about a lot of other people who have been involved in the Me Too movement. A lot of different people's stories, women and other people who were victimized by these abusers over the years. So the show is super meta in that way. And I really appreciate the approach that they're taking and all of these this peppering of these modern day occurrences, what's happening in our culture right now. Because these things are going to be snapshots later on in the future. So now I go back and I watch TV shows like JAG that are serious and have a lot of sociopolitics in them. Or I also will go back and watch things that are silly, like sitcoms, like The Nanny. And you can see a lot of the sociocultural changes over time in these shows that lasted for like 10 years on the air. And I look back at it and I go, whoa, we had a lot of problems with Russia in the early 90s since JAG ran from 1995 to 2005. Their primary villains were the Russians for at least the first half of that. And then for the final component, because we had gone to war in Iraq and Afghanistan while the show was still on the air, the bad guys changed more to be reflective of what we were seeing then and who America's adversaries were largely considered to be. So the focus was removed from Russia and was then placed on storylines related to terrorism and people in the Middle East. So The Boys right now is very timely, but it's in the future going to be somewhat of a time capsule. 
And I think that it's going to be even better watching it in the future, possibly, than it is now. And that's really saying something, because I love this show. And we'll talk more about it next week. Thank you for listening to the GSMC Sci-Fi Podcast, brought to you by the GSMC Podcast Network. I'd like to ask that you please subscribe to the show, and writing a nice review always really helps us. Also, if you could please follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, I'd appreciate it. Thank you kindly, and have a good night. You've been listening to the Golden State Media Concepts Sci-Fi Podcast, part of the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network. You can find this show and others like it at www.gsmcpodcast.com. Download our podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, and Google Play. Just type in GSMC to find all the shows from the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network, from movies to music from sports to entertainment and even weird news you can also follow us on twitter and on facebook thank you and we hope you have enjoyed today's program Thank you.